moving on, um, dark space monitoring. So dark space, if you're not familiar with the term, it's just rebel IP address space that doesn't have any hosts attached. Right? So by definition, any traffic that's going to dark space wasn't solicited. It's not like I sent out a request and got a reply. You're just you're seeing traffic that's going where there shouldn't be traffic going. Um, the big thing that's in dark space is uh, misconfigurations. Um, that's, that's what a lot of your traffic to dark space is going to be, but you're also going to see some bad stuff. Um, reconnaissance. So somebody's scanning the network, trying to figure out where your assets are, where your servers are, what's vulnerable, uh, backscatter. So if you're uh, launching a denial of service attack against the target, maybe you're going to spoof your source IP address so that you know, it's harder to find you. Um, but then your target might send a, uh, an acknowledgment to that spoofed IP address. And if that spoofed IP address is in dark space, you're going to see that track. Right? Uh, same thing for scanning. And then automated virus form spreading. Uh, so same lines as reconnaissance. If you've got some piece of malware that's trying to spread across your network, uh, it, it's going to have to scan. It's going to have to you know, try multiple hosts. Uh, and particularly if it's a piece of software that doesn't know anything about the network, it's going to spread uh, more indiscriminately. So you might see all those in dark space. Next slide. So uh, point being, if you have dark space, it's worth keeping an eye out and understanding what the traffic to it looks like. Um, the beauty of a lot of dark space because they have a lot of address space in general. Not all of it's used. Um, it's an interesting paper in Locon 2012. Uh, Locon is a uh, it, it's it's not a real high level conference, but it's um, a conference where it's more of a workshop where people present things uh, based on NetFlow. So technologies involving NetFlow in one way or another. It's put on by the guys who do Silk. Right. So a lot of the stuff there is Silk. They also occasionally talk about Argus or other things. Um, it's uh, happened to January every year, just happened a few weeks ago. Um, it's worth looking through those proceedings if you're working in the world of NetFlow. Um, anyway, there, there was a paper last year, a uh, presentation about um, looking at IP dark space data and how do you make sense of it. The idea behind the paper was uh, track the entropy in the, the source IP, dest IP, source port, dest port, and look for changes. Uh, and the author actually characterized common events. So this this looks like scanning backscatter. This looks like uh, DDoS. This looks like uh, misconfiguration. Sort of took those high level events and characterized what the actual traffic looked like. Uh, you know, there's some math behind it, and, and uh, so you can do the same kind of thing on your network to get a sense of what what traffic is actually in the backscatter, or is, I'm sorry, is in the uh, in the uh, dark space. So. Um, biometric analysis. This is just sort of a, a let's break down the common attributes and look at what's going on. Um, so you can look at uh, something which a lot of COPS tools do, COPS sources and sinks, right? Top senders and receivers, who's sending and receiving the most traffic in your network. Um, what's the ratio of sent to receive data that your hosts are sending? Uh, in particular, if you're looking for scanning, um, or just off, you can look at how many destination IPs are contacted for per source IP. Uh, and those lists in and themselves don't tell you a whole lot, but uh, something that's interesting you might want to do is look for rates of change, look for change over time. So here's my list of talk talkers. Uh, who's in it this week that wasn't in it last week? Uh, you know, why is that the case that they care about? Um, and then there are the other uh, layers of information. So, in and of itself, it's hard to, to say a whole lot based on just that one piece of information, but when you stick in your IDS alerts uh, or your, your uh, asset based data, um, things become a little clearer, hopefully. Um, and there are a lot of different ways you can provision the data, right? So, you can look at it uh, from a source perspective who's been sending the most bytes, um, you know, what was the rate of uh, uh, ratio of sent received data for source IP. Same thing, you can do it for guest IP. Um, you can do it for a server or for a class of servers. So, so this individual web server, or for, you know, all my web servers, or all of my web servers that are in this one business unit, maybe. Uh, also, if you've got user-based data, you can do it by user. So what users are sending and receiving the most bytes? Um, you're not going to get that just from NetFlow, but uh, if you've got other data sources, hopefully you can combine those. Um, 
also per protocol uh, a, a different layer than the network stack, right? You can, you can do something like a protocol map at layer two, at layer three, at layer four, or at layer seven, um, and look at, at rates of change, uh, sort of your top end list uh, by protocol. Yeah, from, sorry, come back to the, uh, the uh, entropy and IP guards. Yeah, is, 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 that a, uh, yeah. is there a white paper in addition to the, the PowerPoint? I see the PowerPoint's online. Yeah, so uh, the unfortunately at FlowCon, uh, they often don't publish papers. They usually just give presentations. Okay. Um, sometimes if you look at the author websites, they, they have additional information. <laughs> it is one of the sort of the downsides of this. It, it's got a more workshop feel, okay. um, so there often aren't papers. So it can be some kind of hit and miss. Question. See so, if I can find it. Um, so, uh, something else you can look for is on proxy connection. Right, so in, in most places. Um, How much is out there? Okay, good. So, Ben found it. Uh, uh, proxy connections. Um, so, most places you're going to have uh, proxies, particularly for web. Um, and so, your, your web proxies are going to be logged. You're going to be able to see the, that connection information. Hopefully, you're going to pull it back and analyze it and store it. And you can combine it with your things like your standard NetFlow. Um, but there are going to be connections that aren't proxy. Uh, so, if, unless you're looking for those in other ways, you're not going to see them to aggregate them uh, and, and keep them in mind. Uh, and I think there are MITRE firewalls with a bunch of open ports, including things like SSH and FTP. Um, those are worth knowing about. You know, it's worth knowing when somebody's connecting out. Um, uh, do something like look for large flows out uh, as, as a simple way to look for exfiltration. Um, point being, they're not in the proxy log. Uh, I've got a couple of uh, Splunk queries I want to show you. Uh, so in FMX, we've got uh, Splunk, which came through here originally set up for us um, as a means to sort of sift through the data. So, anomaly detection is a difficult thing to do for network intrusion detection um, operationally because uh, traditionally there are a lot of false positives. Um, there's a relatively famous <coughs> paper a couple years ago by uh, Bert Pax, the same guy who built uh, Pro, talking about that. Um, it, it's, it's a hard thing to apply to network security. Um, every time you have uh, an alert, something you're asking the analyst to go trace down and, and dig into, uh, that's human time you're spending doing that, which is you know, expensive. Um, so operationally, um, you know, you need a very, very low false positive rate, which typically anomaly detection doesn't give you. Uh, the idea is that, that what is malicious, I'm sorry, what is anomalous is not necessarily, necessarily malicious. Um, so just because it's weird statistically doesn't mean it's weird or bad. Uh, it, in a sense, that security person is going to care about. Um, but there are some things anomaly detection is good for. Uh, the big one is outages and misconfigurations. So my network just went down. That's something you want to know about, uh, even if only so you can tell that that ops guy. Um, and it, it's probably uh, the loudest thing that they are most easily going to find. Um, denial of service attacks tend to be loud and large. Uh, so you're going to see a lot of incoming uh, traffic from a lot of different sources. Uh, it's distributed in China. Yeah, presumably it would be. Um, port scanning, um, certainly uh, traditionally port scanning is relatively easy to find uh, in NetFlow. Uh, you know, looking at uh, one source and scanning a lot, either a lot of hosts or a lot of different ports on a host. Uh, and, you know, as attackers get more patient, more complicated, maybe they're scanning more slowly, or scanning from a lot of different boxes, so it's harder to pick up. Um, and then works are uh, you know, very quickly uh, and both anomalous and both. Um, and, and this kind of stuff is, you know, tends to be loud. And it's, you, you can find these sort of mechanisms in a lot of different commercial tools. Uh, you know, things will tell you about denial of service attacks or warm spreading. Um, just another pointer back to the academic work. There was an interesting paper uh, finally mining anomaly using traffic feature distribution. Uh, paper was a few years ago now, I guess. Um, so they're looking for uh, changes in the distribution of, of uh, fields over time. So, so graph all of your source IP addresses uh, and do a histogram. Um, 
look at how they're changing uh, you know, hour by hour and day by day. Uh, so th there's a lot of been a lot of work on uh, looking at anomalies uh, in network security. Uh, this is just one of many papers on the subject. However, there are some there are some protocols uh, that it is good to look at anomalies for. Uh, it, it's a little more operationally useful. Um, things like DNS, uh, NTP network time protocol, uh, SMB the server message block protocol, uh, Windows file sharing. Um, SNMP, LDAP. So these protocols are all relatively regular, right? With DNS, you send typically a one packet uh, request, you get a one packet reply, uh, and that's the end of it. Uh, if you've got a large amount of data going over DNS, that's you know, unusual. Um, as opposed to something like HTTP. Um, so these protocols are nice because they're all pretty well constrained, they're all single use. You use DNS to look up domain names and get the response back. Uh, HTTP uh, statistically is a very wild protocol, right? A lot of different things ride over HTTP. It's used in a lot of different ways. Just trying to look for anomalies over HTTP is just going to keep your focus. Um, statistically, it's so convoluted that it's, it's going to be impossible to make any sense of. Um, we can talk about some of these protocols in a little more detail, though. So uh, let's talk about DNS in particular. Um, and the use case here is just one one. So one of the use cases here, one of the popular ones, is tunnel detection, right? So you're at an airport, and they want you to pay to use the Wi-Fi. Uh, cheap, you don't want to do that. What do you do? Uh, if you have a DNS server under your control, and the airport allows DNS out, you can uh, encapsulate your IP data inside DNS uh, requests. Send it to the DNS server you control. It can uh, unwrap the DNS, forward the IP on for you, uh, get the response back, and then send it back to you over DNS. Right? It can act as, act as a proxy for you. Um, you know, this is actually uh, I wouldn't say a common thing, but it's certainly something you can do. You can find open source tools that do IP tunneling over DNS, uh, specifically, <coughs> usually for times you're at a, a, a Wi-Fi hotspot that you don't want to pay for. Um, there was an academic paper on this uh, detection of DNS knowledge using flow. They, they were looking at uh, tunneling, <coughs> so uh, there was a trojan spread over DNS, uh, so looking for that kind of behavior. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can approach this. In this paper, what they did, they took DNS packets, and they, they grouped them into three different groups, right? Requests, replies, and unknown. I'm, I'm not sure what this is, uh, just based on four numbers. Uh, Again, they calculated histograms uh, over packet size per hour per day. So, what, what's my normal distribution look like for uh, DNS requests between 10 and 11 a.m., for instance? Uh, and if you look for changes in that histogram, uh, you can throw up an alert when you see one. Uh, other thing you do with DNS, maybe you could look for HTTP flows that are preceded by DNS requests. Uh, so, you'd have to take caching into account. But then that's going to get you things uh, that aren't, you know, aren't a person at the keyboard, uh, right? So a lot of what's going to get you is probably uh, automated updates uh, or something using a hard-coded IP address, uh, which occasionally might be malware, right? What? What about the DNS result address so that it cache? Yes, that's a good question. So. Uh, Veronica asked, what about uh, DNS being cached? And that is something you'd have to take into account with that. If you're doing that analytic, you're going to have to see you know, what, what normal DNS cache on my clients, and then uh, take that into account and say, I saw a DNS request you know, an hour ago for this site, so I'm going to just. You, know. you could probably look at the proxy while it's right, so if that it wasn't present in the proxy, then it's probably not going to. So uh, that was DNS. Let's talk a little bit more about SMB, server message block. Uh, it's just for Windows <coughs> file sharing, uh, you know, Windows printing, those kinds of things. Um, oftentimes, uh, when an attacker gets into a network, they uh, land on a box. They send somebody a malicious Word document or a, you know, a bad link in an email, and somebody opens it, clicks on it, and then they're infected. Um, so that, most of the time, is not where the attacker wanted to end up. 
right? So, so they uh, maybe they want information on a specific project, or they just want to gain a larger, larger foothold in the enterprise. Um, so, one way they do that is over SMB. Um, so, in this case, you know, they get in on one computer, and then the dot line, then going back up to the uh, distribution layer, coming back down to another computer. Um, SMB is popular because uh, it's built into Windows and you can do something called passing the hash. So you can take uh, Windows credentials that are in memory uh, and you can dump them, uh, either dump the hash or uh, brute force the password. Anyway, you can gain credentials in one way or another uh, and then use that to connect to another machine over SMB and remotely execute code as some other user on that machine. Um, so this case here is lateral movement, right? Moving between machines uh, within an enterprise, often between clients. Um, one uh, technique for doing that is using the net use command to remotely connect to another machine using credentials you have uh, either dumped from memory or uh, uh, cracked. Uh, you can copy or execopy to move a malicious binary or malicious batch file over to another machine. Using the app command, which is like cron on Windows, to remotely execute that file. Right. So the interesting thing here from a network perspective is if you're, you're pulling up a command line in Windows and remotely executing these commands uh, one after another, they're all going to go uh, over the same TCP stream. Right? So there's some underlying service that's uh, managing the connections for these commands and they're all, uh, all going over the same TCP session. Uh, the result is you've got a relatively large byte count and duration. Um, so one way to look for lateral movement is to um, look at SMB and, and filter just on connections with uh, large duration of byte count. Um, now, of course, SMB is Windows file sharing and print sharing. So there's going to be a legitimate traffic that supposedly too that's going to look like this. Uh, and you're going to have to filter out that from uh, malicious behavior. So you can't just say, oh, large SMB connection, that's bad. Uh, you need to look into it. Um, this is sort of the, something you see a lot when you're dealing with that flow is like we have an initial indication something might be wrong, but it's not going to tell you 100% yes or no, right? You're going to need other data sources. You're going to need GCAC, you're going to need post based data. Uh, you're going to need to really uh, dig into something to confirm it as a, an incident. Um, and you need sensors placed to see this. So um, if you think about the, the on site visibility or, or the uh, post flow visibility on the network, you, you need that kind of visibility to look at this. If you're just looking at the boundary, you're not going to see uh, connections between clients within your enterprise. 